we'll be having a very exciting session today and we are really really very happy to have you with us we indulge you to kindly be patient as other colleagues will be joining us we will actually begin at the top of the hour 1 p.m gmt time in a crowd and whatever that time may be for you depending on where you're joining from know that we will be starting at the top of the hour in the meantime it will be very great if you can just quickly tell us where you're joining from you know in the chat you know just your name your organization your country and you may want to put uh, the city in which you're joining from that will help refresh my geography lessons as i am missing out on some of those beautiful cities across the world you know it will just be good to let us know. I am actually joining from uh, Cameroon, Yaoundé, the capital city, and it is uh, somewhat dull sunny. I don't know if there's any weather like that, but uh, that's what the, the, the weather is like here. But it would be good to just read from those of us who are joining us now on where you are joining in from. Thank you again for being with us. And uh, in the meantime, we'll keep uh, welcoming other participants who are joining us and uh, we hope to begin at the top of the hour thank you very much augustin faton merci d'être avec nous depuis le bénin c'est de quelle ville um, il y a Koutounou, il y a j'ai oublié les autres villes de au bénin yeah. Abome Kalavi, c'est ça le nom dont je cherchais. Thank you very much, uh, Camille Soji, all the way from Kutuno. Thank you very much, Sini Odonta, uh, joining all the way from Lagos. I guess Lagos should be very busy this and hot this afternoon. Thank you very much, Sini, for joining us. And I'm sure we will be having a wonderful session. So colleagues, once again, thank you for joining this um, third webinar in a series of three. So this is the last, of course, on alternative financing models for civil society organizations. And uh, we will be starting at the top of the hour that will be 1 p.m. GMT time in Accra. So in the meantime, we will be glad to know from each and every one of us where we are joining, who is in the room, where we are joining from, you know, the country, the city, your organization. Augustin works from, uh, works for the ONG Bouge, the, N the Bouge NGO. I hope I translated it correctly. Thank you for joining, Augusta. And I will be introducing our wonderful speakers in a short moment when we begin. Um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag. They are very, very special from South America, from West Africa, in fact, from Africa. You know, we have some of the best minds who will be talking to us on social impact investment. Mustafa Faiz, it's always a pleasure interacting with you. Thank you, Mustafa is joining all the way from Quebec in Canada. He's a PhD candidate at Laval University. And colleagues, we can just uh, take some time and just read about, you know, where colleagues are joining from. This is equally a virtual networking opportunity for us. Obong Matthew, um, all the way from Nigeria, from Oyo in Nigeria, uh, works for, well, plastic culture, tackles, single use plastic abuse by end users. Well, he works to reduce the impact of plastics, you know, or the negative impact of plastics in on our environment. Thank you very much. And for colleagues who are joining 
um, who are French speakers. There is interpretation available in French and English. So you can go down to your um, the bottom of your Zoom platform. Uh, on the icons that are there, you will find one that is like a globe you know, the interpretation symbol and you click on it and choose the French language or the language of preference. Pour ceux qui nous joignent, qui parlent que la langue française, vous pouvez, il y a les services d'interprétation, vous pouvez, uh, vous pouvez uh, aller sur uh, la langue, sur votre écran, Euh, le plateforme Zoom, en bas de votre écran, il y a le symbole de l'interprétation. C'est comme le globe ou le monde. Donc, vous pouvez cliquer sur cela et vous choisissez votre langue de préférence. Merci beaucoup. Vous avez un bon accent en français. Merci, Augustin. Je me débrouille. Ce n'est pas si facile. Bon. Du tout quand il fait chaud. <laughs> Thank you, Richard Penn, uh, Sembe World from the far north region of Cameroon. Oh, cold, dry Hamatans. Far north region, which town are you in? It will be good to know, Richard. Thank you. Uh, Ademola is joining all the way from Lagos. Thank you for joining us. In a minute's time, we will kick off the conversation. Once again, thank you very much, colleagues, for joining this particular session. It is the third in a series of three, of course, the last, and it's focusing on alternative financing models for civil society organizations. Uh, by the close of this session, we will equally share the recordings of previous sessions for those who might not have participated in them so that you can you know, keep them and follow them after this session. Meanwhile, this session is actually going to focus on social impact investment. Thank you very much, wonderful team of Waxi, you know, for facilitating this. The music is quite refreshing. I can see it's really making me to feel revived while anxiously waiting for the brilliant contributions from our speakers who are equally eagerly waiting to share their insights with us. Thank you very much, Dr. Ebunlomo Walker, all the way from Ibadan. I love the city of Ibadan. And there is going to be a registration link being shared in the chat. We kindly invite us all to click on it and put in our details. That enables Waxi to stay in touch with you share other opportunities, um, webinars, um, you know, training opportunities, research opportunities, and in case you want to collaborate with us, these are pieces of information that may come your way and facilitate the continuous collaboration between Waxi and your institution. We will be starting now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for taking our time to join this session. It is the third in a series of conversations on alternative financing models for civil society organizations. The experiences that we are learning in diverse fields are helping us to actually harness how we tap into available resources from diverse opportunities at our disposal. WAPSI, the West Africa Civil Society Institute, and the Star Ghana Foundation, all based in Accra, Ghana, are very pleased to bring to you this particular session. And today, we will be focusing on a very technical, yet we have wonderful presenters who will be simplifying not only the concept, but equally the practice of social impact investment. That is actually going to be the focus of the conversation today. And so we are very much pleased to have you here with us to exchange on this particular topic. And uh, for those who are just joining us, this discussion is actually going to be in the English and French languages. So depending on your language of preference, 
you can move to the bottom of the screen, the Zoom uh, platform, and you select the interpretation icon, click on it and select your language of preference. Permit me to say this in French for those who may be joining us and following just in English. Pour ceux qui nous joignent et qui parlent que la langue française, il y a les services d'interprétation pour cette discussion. Donc, pour y suivre les conversations en langue française, bien vouloir cliquer sur votre plateforme. En bas de votre écran, il y a l'icône in interprétation. Cliquez sur ce icône et choisissez la langue de votre préférence. Le français qui est dénommé par F. R. Merci beaucoup les collègues. Je veux retourner en langue anglaise euh, parce que c'est ma langue préférée. Euh, ce jour. Thank you very much once again. And I am Jim Chick from Njong. I work for the West Africa Civil Society, no, 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 no. which is based in Accra. We invite all participants to kindly keep your microphones on mute. We, will, we have actually allocated some time for exchanges and we will take comments, be it in the chat, or you can raise your hand and we'll give you the opportunity to share your perspectives. But please keep your mic strictly on mute to ensure that we have a smooth conversation. And I will be moving on now to exchange with our uh, panelists who are here with us. Um, Fortunately, we have a lady and a gentleman, and as and a gentleman, and as a gentleman, permit me to begin with the lady, Anatu Ben Lawal, all the way from Accra, Ghana. Anatu, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm very well, thank you. Happy to be here. I, oh, great! And I can see that on the glowing smile on your face. Anatu Ben Lawal is an enterprise business development practitioner with over 15 years experience creating and supporting social media, uh, social media enterprises, uh, solutions across 15 uh, countries on the African, African continent. She currently leads Social Innovation Africa, which is a social enterprise enabler and think tank that is focused on researching and driving the enabling policy environment that will lead from Africa into the fourth and fifth industrial revolutions. She has worked extensively with international non-governmental organizations such as Water Aid, Action Aid, The Hunger Project, and multinationals such as Defeat and USAID. We are so, so happy and delighted to have you with us this afternoon, Anato. Thank you. Great. great. And, and, and to you, Anato, even before we kick off the, the, the conversation, why is it important to have this discussion at, at this time? Just one minute. Uh, it's important because uh, it has been happening for a number of years and uh, recently COVID has also highlighted and uh, expressed uh, the vulnerability and the fragility of uh, um, states and uh, NGOs and funding. So currently the model that exists is social enterprise and uh, there is no more donor funding as we know it and many of them have exited. So impact investing, social entrepreneurship is what the, the future is. And already is we are we are actually a little bit late coming to the conversation. So this is critical for civil society. Better so well, late than never, as some will say. Thank you very much, Anato. And again, it's <laughs> good to to have you here with us. I can see you on all the way from South America joining us. You know, I like South America and Africa because we are brothers. You know, yesterday there was a friendly match between Ghana and one of the beautiful South American countries. And, you know, they just had to let Ghana go, so that, which was yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Yuan, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon over there. How are you? Um, I am very, very fine. So Juan Carlos Lozano is the founder and CEO of Impactia, an investment platform for impact. He is a seasoned social entrepreneur and has worked across several civil society organizations such as CISV International. Carlos Lozano is a professor of civil society and project management in FIGRI, finance, government, and international relations postgraduate course at the Externado de Colombia University in Bogota. It is so good to have you here with us this afternoon, Yuan. 
It's so, so good to be here. I'm, I'm very pleased. Thank you so much for, for this uh, very kind invitation. Um, um, it, it's been a while since uh, um, I was also there in Ghana a while. It's only three years and a pandemic in between. Um, so I was uh, missing you guys very much and, and just, uh, you know, missing out very much the, the power of uh, African civil society. Um, that I have, we I think we have a loads um, to also learn from. So so very very thankful for for this exchange. Great! It is always good to have you share your insights with us, Yuan. And thank you very much for joining us. So we'll dive right deep into the conversation. And before we do that, please, colleagues, there is a registration form being shared in the chat feel free to click on it and uh, register as we will continue engaging with you in the future. And as the speakers get to share their insights with us, if you have a burning question, a burning observation, do share it in the chat and we will raise that with our speakers or you can note it down. And when we have the space for discussions, you know, you can raise your hand and we will call you up to make your wonderful contributions. At this juncture, I would like to invite Anna to Ben Lawa. You said we are coming in late into this conversation. However, better late than never. And when we talk social impact investment, what is it all about? And what's in it for civil society in West Africa, in Africa, and for all of us following this conversation? Anatu? Okay, thank you very much, Jim. And yes, I actually uh, agree that better late than never. And we always know what happens to those who come late. They actually overtake everybody else that has been on the scene. So very much looking forward to what civil society and the contributions and actually fashioning something that actually works for Africa. Not just so, there are many sides to impact investing. One will speak in more detail about the financial side and the breakdown of what kinds of funds there are, there are bonds, there are, you know, we need to find what works for Africa at this juncture because uh, impact investing is still very new on the continent. And so quite limiting at the moment, quite limited in terms of examples, et cetera, because there are two sides to social enterprise. So when we talk about social enterprise, there's the individual entrepreneur who has come up with some uh, unicorn or some amazing project or product or whatever, and he's looking for investment. And so that's the one we normally hear about. And that's the ones that has movements and pitch days and social, when they talk about social enterprise, we are now looking at how do we now as a civil society organization that has been doing NGO type of work with core funding, uh, staff overheads, et cetera, et cetera. How do we also now get into a model of impact investment that suits what, what we are doing right now and allows us to be able to deliver the important work that we are doing, but also, uh, scale up to also look and include um, other models and approaches, including impact investment. So that's what uh, I'm here for, and that's what I'm about. And I'm very interested in this conversation, interested in driving it. I have been implementing, I've had the opportunity to receive impact investing um, over the last two years for three projects. So I'll share a little bit on two that we did. And at the moment, it's still very, like I said, we're still trying to form something, but I think that there's huge potential and everybody here will be able to take away um, something that uh, uh, they feel that they can now look at their model that they are using and then begin to adjust that towards impact investing. So we can That's, move to that. Yes, please continue with that. It's quite interesting. I'm already very eager to learn more <laughs> about your rich experiences. Ah, Carry on, yeah. please. <laughs> okay, can we have the next slide, please? So we all have heard and we know so well, and we have researched and discussed what COVID-19 and its effects have had on our countries. Uh, we know that Africa is going, I think 31 countries are going to the IMF again for the only God knows how many times. And uh, currently we all know that uh, here in Nigeria, in many countries, it's not looking good. Even for globally, you know, many countries are going to recession and there's um, a bit of chaos everywhere. But I'm actually somebody who believes that uh, the, the end of something signals the beginning of something new. So we don't have to panic. It's difficult, I do agree, but it's the time to allow for creativity, allow for innovation. We have the Africa continental free trade coming up. 
And so how are we now going to ensure participation for ourselves, for women, for youth? And what is the new path that Africa is charting? Um, one of the challenges with uh, the aid model, the traditional aid model has been in terms of impacts, being unable, donors being dissatisfied with um, uh, impact. And so now the more business-like approach has come out. So um, it has also, what uh, COVID-19 has done, it has also provided certain windows of opportunity for gender equality, climate, agribusiness, et cetera, to adopt more innovative approaches for impact. And I don't know if you've been following the news, but last year, all the donors got together and pledged 40 billion to gender equality. So that's what is going to be at the forefront of everything that we do, even with corporate institutions, gender, and everything around that is what they are looking at. And so if I talk about gender a little bit, that's because that is going to be the focus for the next five years. I know that there has been gender initiatives in the past, but this one is a specific initiative. So even with impact investors on the continent at the moment, Everything that you do has to be geared towards gender and youth and young people and inclusion, especially. So that's really, really important, especially because the AU is also trying to in, um, assure about 30 million jobs uh, in the next five years. And so that's a challenge that this continent has. And so impact investing is also looking at addressing that. So the pandemic coincided with other significant events. So it's not just, oh, there was a pandemic and things went wrong and women are vulnerable, et cetera. We also had to look at the issue of the donor climate, which has always been a challenge the last few years since the financial uh, crash. Africa Beyond Aid, which is uh, something that our president uh, heralded. It hasn't gone bad so far, but I believe that we can still do it. And then the fourth industrial revolution and then uh, the fifth industrial revolution. And all of those lead us to less people, but more the future of work, looking at less uh, people and more machine use. And so all this is actually transforming the economy and transforming the way we do work, the way we do civil society, how we do our work, uh, more virtual, less of, you know, so how are we going to handle that and how are we going to innovate to ensure that uh, we create jobs around that and so that our economies do not suffer. So these new approaches for economic survival are more business oriented because the traditional aid model gave us, you receive your funding, you go and implement, you bring back the results. But whereas with impact investing, it's actually looking at how do we now involve access markets? How do we contribute to markets? How we drive that so that we gain profit to reinvest in our social enterprises and also give the benefit to investors. So it's actually really exciting. And it has a lot of implications for Africa as a continent, which because we have been so um dependent on aid and traditional so it has implications for philanthropy it has implications for everything and so this whole movement beyond even impact investing needs to be written about it needs to be discussed it needs to be you know because we need to find our own models the way impact investing is being done in certain parts of the world is more advanced or maybe they have different types of investors so we now look have to look at what works for africa in this first two years, few years, what will work in the next five years, et cetera. And all this has implications for civil society as a whole. And so um, the pandemic and its long-term effects, especially the loss of jobs, we all know what happened with uh, everybody losing their jobs, coming home, et cetera, et cetera. We were all affected about it. I was implementing um, a DFID project that was worth millions of pounds in Sierra Leone for women and girls. And uh, we all had to come back home halfway because all the donors you know, had to cancel and you know, so all of that has implications and now we are in the COVID recovery period. And so as we are recovering, we are also looking at a new model to fund and finance and invest in that. Next slide, please. So what is impact investing? What is all this, you know, all this talk and, you know, and all of that about investing? It has become a hot topic among donors and financial investors alike, but actually it has been around for the last 10 years um 15 years but um last 10 years it has it has really been around and for people who are investment savvy and into the investment space it already exists for them but it coming to the forefront in terms of donors in terms of you know the traditional model and switch uh and uh, the 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 it's it really just means investing capital to generate social impact in a way that also provides monetary returns and i want you to have that in mind because if you enter impact investing, you have to generate returns. It is no different from you going to the bank and saying, 
I'm going for a loan. Um, and so uh, I will get the loan and I'll make some money and some profit and then I'll bring it back to you. And so I'll pay you off with that. And so impact investors are no different from any investors. The way they measure is different. The approach is also a little bit different because before they give you the money, they want to ensure that you're actually impacting those communities that you say you are, you are doing. But bottom line first comes profitability. And so if you want to go into impact investing at the moment, for me here in Africa, it actually really, really works only if you're a social enterprise. In other places, there are other ways of measuring the impact and it depends on the investor. But here in Africa at the moment, I will tell you whether with open society, with um, Bill and Gates, uh, do, um, uh, Global Affairs Canada, et cetera, it has to generate profit. So you have to be a social enterprise. So you can look at maybe if you're an NGO, a civil society organization, becoming a social enterprise where you have your for-profit arm and that for-profit arm is what is going to engage in impact investing, not your core, uh, your, so if you're to peace and security and all those things that do not actually provide a service or a product, it, it, it actually doesn't apply in that way. But I actually still believe that you can still do impact investing when you're in peace and security, but you need to be a social enterprise. So the, the returns that you pay back, the, the, they vary from the initial principal amount upward, depending on the nature of the investments. And so that, that, that's what it is in a nutshell. And we can go to the next slide. So in a nutshell, impact investments are investors, investments made with the intention to generate positive, measurable social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. And so, but the financial return comes first. I just want you to bear that in mind because I keep on having this challenge with civil society organizations, financial return, and then the social and environmental impact also follow. They go hand in hand and they have to be accurate because what happens is that an investor can pull out at any moment. So you actually have to be impacting and doing the social things that you say you do. So inclusion, women, girls, um, social cohesion, whatever it is that you have assured the investor that you do, it's also as important as the, uh, the profit that you also promised them. So when you look at a donor like Global Affairs, I always like to be practical because we are here and we need practical examples. Global Affairs is one organization and one donor uh, who is currently leading in terms of funding the continent. So at the moment, they are the ones giving us a lot of grants and have been towards women and social enterprise, et cetera, et cetera. And Global Affairs Canada give you funding based on the fact that you are a social enterprise and you can then become uh, generate some income through your, your, you know. So what happens with that model is that uh, for me, where I sit, it's either the individual entrepreneur or you set up a social enterprise arm or the cooperative model, which is what I've been working with, is also another great way of assessing impact investing because when you have cooperatives who are with agribusiness and they are doing products or sustainable agri, climate, et cetera, et cetera, you actually have a product at the end that you can uh, invest etc in and then uh, get the, the social impact as well in the process so these are the three things that i think currently works for africa works for us as we sit here because the uh, i've also mentioned that uh, the hello yes can you hear me S sorry um anatu kindly continue participants kindly okay. keep your microphones on mute you know, this example on Glo 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 Global Affairs Canada was really getting me excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I just thought I'll be sharing very practical example. Who right yes. now is sponsoring this area? It's all the donors, actually. Bill and Melinda Gates, etc. But in Ghana and in Africa, especially West Africa at the moment, Global Affairs Canada, locally and internationally, are the ones who are really funding this type of work. So last year, I did a project to, um, with them which was around girls' incubations, sexual and gender-based violence, et cetera. But it had a business component. It had a food incubator at the end. So they uh, gave us money uh, to do that. Next slide, please. So to, to, to wrap that area up, Impact Investing simply offers an alternative to philanthropists who reject the notion that there's a binary decision between investing for profits and giving money to a social cause. So there's another kind of impact investing called venture philanthropy, but Africa is not there yet. And so, which is actually a good, you know, where you get philanthropists who actually want, who are more concerned about the social element. And I think that's a really good fit. But at the moment, we don't really have in many 
um, philanthropists coming to invest in that area, but it does exist. Um, traditional grant making overcomes market-based failures because it's free. You know, you don't have to get involved in all the business and the markets and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, and so it's quite easy to get that in a way. Impact investing also leverages the power of markets to create change. So when you get into a, uh, the first question, one of the first questions that I, if you are applying for an, uh, from an, uh, an impact fund, is this access to markets issue. Never forget that. They will always, always tell you about access, ask you about how you're going to get markets, create them, or how you're going to access other markets globally or locally. So when it comes to the issue of the, like I said, the social enterprise side, entrepreneurship side of, 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 your, of your organization, it has to be doing a product or a service that has profitability. So let me give you a practical example. One of the things uh, I've recently applied for in partnership with say the University of Ghana was an EU grant to create um, networks and markets, linkages between the North and the South of Ghana. So that when we produce any products, we can bring it to the South from the North and be able to put it in the supermarkets and be able to offer it here and other places to be able to access that and make markets. So that's also very, very important. And the creation of those linkages are important because why? Because eventually also ACFTA is coming and that's a game changer for the continent. And whether you are on the business side or the social side, there's a lot of things that's going to have a lot of impact. ACFTA is going to impact, you know, it's not quite there, it's at 75%, I believe. We had a conference last week. But it's very interesting when you listen to what's going on around and how it's going to impact. So the issue of markets, how are we now going to send products to other places? How are we going to trade among ourselves? How are we, are we going to trade and exchange social services and learnings among ourselves in a, in a way that it's easier, et cetera? So um, as I said, impact investing is in, in its infancy is relatively unproved across Africa because it's in the new stages. Everybody's coming to it a little bit late and cautiously, but I believe that uh, we'll catch up very, very soon. And it's important that uh, we do this. And this is why I'm very happy that WAPS is holding this because if we don't come to conversations early, then somebody makes the decisions for us. So what's happening is that there's a whole um, social enterprise system that is actually that actually works for entrepreneurs, but does not necessarily work for civil society organizations who are bigger, et cetera, et cetera. And so they have their little, they are, they are the ones, social enterprise Ghana, uh, they have their networks, they have their pitch days, they have their pitch days, they have a whole system around that. And that works well for them. But if we are civil society don't determine what we are going to also bring or create, then somebody will sit somewhere and decide or leave us out of the conversation and not consider our models in, 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 in terms of where they want to go. So um, really, really good that we are having this meeting. So next slide, please. So impact investing versus traditional grant making. Um, so impact investing is geared towards the profit-making aspect of social enterprises. Uh, it does not provide core funding and tends to be project-based. So you get, like I mentioned, you get funding because of the aspects of, um, of your, your social enterprise side of your nonprofits, so for civil society. But it also provides something called, we call it technical support. So they'll give you a percentage, say 10% of the grant for technical support, which you can also use for admin, et cetera, et cetera. But for our, those of us who are used to working in civil society organizations that have 50 people, 100 people, the global organization, we know that that's, that does not cover um, staff overheads, et cetera. So that is where blended finance comes in. And I believe that Juan will be speaking more about that so that the blended finance can take care of your core and all those soft approaches and then impact investing can take care of your business side. What is interesting to donors now do is that you need to have that social enterprise set up, even if it is not fully developed before you can even access um, traditional funds to now implement your projects because everybody now wants to see sustainability. So when we talk about sustainability, yes, it is more than financial returns, et cetera, but really that's the core of what we're talking about. How are you going to sustain yourself beyond the five years, beyond the three years? And I believe we've had a lot of conversations now uh, with Waxi when I was working with them, and this has been something that is on the heart of the organization. How do we guarantee civil society sustainability beyond traditional grant making? As I said, uh, it's not suitable for NGOs that do not have a project or business focus. In other words, traditional NGOs, no, but social NGOs that are becoming or have become social enterprises, yes. 
The other thing is that they don't necessarily give you the money directly. So whether you get 8 million, I'm working, doing a project with uh, Presby Greek Services, and I believe that uh, they access the grant for several million. So they paid for the tractors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but they did not give them the money directly. So bear that in mind. So it's not another uh, vehicle to receive money. And then, you know, if you want tractors or you want equipment, they will purchase every single thing. And even the technical support, then they'll also get another partner to come and give you that technical support. So as an investment vehicle, when you apply for a, to an impact fund, you must fulfill all investment due diligence. There's no difference between that and applying for a loan or anything like that. Um, there's no flexibility because these actually are investors who are actually putting their money in there. So they're quite strict on that. And so the due diligence is very, very, very rigid. But once you pass that, then uh, you're okay. It's actually a wonderful system and you get a lot of support from your impact, your impact investors. Next slide. I hope everybody's getting more and more excited. <laughs> So in every, uh, the same way we have a, a civil society ecosystem and networks, etc. there's actually impact investing ecosystem and social enterprise ecosystems in every country, sub-region, global, if you look hard enough, so they exist. Um, impact funds are usually given or managed by a variety of people from individuals to banks. That's what makes it interesting. So a bank like Fidelity can access funding to say have a wash, something around wash that wash entrepreneurs or people doing impact projects in the water sector can access. It can be an individual, it can be a family foundation that are using the impact investing model. Um, and so it, it differs and that's what makes it really, really brief. If the investor is passionate about something he can create or the philanthropist, an impact fund that people can access around that. And so um, women, youth, renewable energy, climate-centered agriculture, etc. But remember the profit-making elements. You can next slide, please. One of the advantages of impact investing that I have to say I'm really, really enjoying is that uh, there is no cap to the amount one can apply for. They have, they really, they, they tend to invest huge amounts in the millions of dollars because that is how they make profit. So the bigger the investments, the bigger the profits. And so all these investors and they are, you know, are able to now get their, you know, so they like to do it over a long year, a five year, 10 year period. And it runs into millions of dollars and it can be up to 100, 200 million dollars, 50 million dollars. They do not like small sums of money. And that's really exciting for some of us who can see the future and then we can now design really impactful models. So because impact is the focus, there is room, so much room for creativity and new models like innovation. So innovation drives this and and what gets them excited is something innovative in the agribusiness sector that will bring relief, bring relief to women, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, it also has, it doesn't have the rigid administrative processes that traditional grants require. Uh, it, all, those of us from civil society knows how long it takes to do the due diligence, the traditional grants, the reporting and the delays, et cetera, et cetera. You don't get that with impact investors. You actually get a committee as well when you get, you know, there's a, a, a fund committee. So it's actually quite straightforward, just that uh, in terms of accessing it, you have to just think that you've gone to a bank or a financial institution. So you have to meet all those requirements. But after you have been approved, et cetera, they, 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 it doesn't have the same rigidity. So, as I said, once you have won, it's not like you are going to be left alone. The people who have given you their money are also interested in um, monitoring you. So there's going to be a fund committee. They also have structures, just the same way in civil society. We have executive directors. We have this. We have a board, et cetera. It's the same with impact funds as well. Um, next slide, please. The disadvantage of impact investment for nonprofits. At this stage, it cannot be done if the nonprofit has not transitioned to a social enterprise model. Unless they clearly state that it's a different kind of model that a certain fund is pushing, don't go and apply as an NGO because you'll be turned down as a nonprofit. You know, unless they clearly state that uh, um, um, civil society or NGOs can apply, social enterprises can apply definitely. So if you are an, uh, an NGO and you have a social enterprise model, definitely you can apply. But you will apply using your other aspects, and then you also share that you're a social enterprise and you are also having impacts and doing these core areas, et cetera. And, but this is your business model. One of the challenges is that because our civil societies were, were initially because of traditional grants making, you have a policy manager, you have a 
all these, you know, you don't have somebody like an access to market manager, which is what impact investing, you know, somebody who's in charge of market, somebody who's in charge of uh, portfolios, somebody who's in charge of, you know, so usually the kind of staff that you need in your social enterprise, the enterprise bit is really very different from the, the core stuff that exists in the NGO section. But that is great. I actually think it's a really, really beautiful model. So the, the, the NGO model aspect and focus on um, getting grants, the few grants that are still left in this world, or go to people like um, Global Affairs Canada, DFID UK, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, you have your enterprise units, which is also very different. And if it's formed well, it should have different kinds of staff and people who are more business-minded because you have to generate the profit and you have to pay back. So profits have to be guaranteed with minimal risks. And sorry, I keep going like that. I just, because I know where we are all coming from and I'm also a civil society person, I understand sometimes the way we think. Uh, so it, it really is investment. So profits have to be guaranteed. So be careful who you appoint, if you access uh, investment funds, who you appoint, who handles it, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise you, you, you get into a lot of trouble. And make sure that if you have to hire new staff members and you have to get other people on board, then so be it. That's how it has to work. Sometimes some of the, we the leaders, we the executive directors, some people are more business minded than others. So this works well for them. If you know you don't have experience in that area, it is good to get a deputy or another person uh, or departmental head who can assist because their background is more of the business uh, approach than uh, the NGO approach. Like I said, because you have to generate profit, you, it can only work if you are doing things like agri health, travel industries, where products or services are produced. Um, I'm sure there are other ways that I haven't considered. But currently, I'm telling you about the situation in Africa right now. In other places, they've been able to go beyond that. Uh -huh. So you can. So now, one of the challenges that uh, we have that you can only access impact investing based on your social enterprise model. Obviously, that has become clear. So if your social enterprise model is interesting, innovative, quirky, et cetera, et cetera, and can guarantee profits, that's where you win. So the focus for impact investing has to be on how do we now create that social enterprise model that is, uh, that is interesting to impact investors. And I'll share one with you, uh, the one I did uh, for Ghana and Senegal, just to give you an idea. I'm not saying going to use that, but just to give you an idea in terms of how uh, investors think. Next slide, please. So here are my women. Uh, I'm working in Northeast Ghana uh, with this project and also in Northeast Senegal. And uh, one of the groups we are working with is a disabled group. They are women's groups and we are teaching them leadership and all those wonderful things because it's a recovering, it's a recovering from conflict and uh, from co um, conflict zone coupled with the recovery from uh, COVID. But what we are doing is that we are teaching these women share butter extraction. But ours is different. We are actually creating a brand. So we have partnered with Presbyterian Agri Services who have 27,000 women in shea butter processing. So they've had these women for ages. Everybody's doing shea butter, nothing new there. But actually when we look at uh, the Presbyterian church, if it creates a brand because it has so many members, creating a brand for it so that all Presbyterians will go and buy is really, really cool. And also looking at the fact that uh, religious institutions and civil societies have never been able to partner well, you know, um, one thing that this is bringing us, it's forcing us to come up with creative models. So Social Innovation Africa, uh, Presby Greek Services and Social Innovation Africa have came together to put up this plan. Okay, we have these women, can we now create a series? What can we do around share butter, et cetera? So we now began to train different, part, different uh, numbers of these cooperatives to come up with a product that is unique to them. So maybe, um, this is the woman in Northeast, and they are capable of producing uh, something, uh, shea butter that has coffee in it, or a, a face mask around shea butter, or soap, or detergent. So we, you know, we do that, and then they sell, not only to the Presby Church, but they sell to the community wider. So now we've now created an access to markets, and being able to transport the, the products from North in Ghana and bring them here as well. But even in North in Ghana, they can sell and they can access that. What does that do? First of all, it it's, um, guarantees the women a form of livelihood beyond the usual farming cycle. During the dry seasons, etc., women are still vulnerable. So, you know, and it's women and girls. And they can do this and they can be the product producers. And the Presby Church can also put a little bit on that and then sell. 
and their members can buy it and all of us wonderful civil society in support of this kind of model can also go and buy that and even then to the point where uh, we have European markets as well because share butter is such a you know but we've never been able to take share butter a civil society beyond just training women in share butter corporates do it you know there's a lot of different brands but why not civil society so we are doing this with these women in Tinguri so that's their picture there and uh, that I'm sharing and that's why they are smiling and why are they smiling because because of the process of becoming a cooperative that is going to access finance they were able to also get a partnership with Fuji Oil to create um, lubricants. So what they do with lubricant uh, with uh, Fuji Oil now is provide them with a uh, shea butter oil worth five hundred thousand Ghana cedis every year. And the last time they did this, I was uh, in the meeting, and we were watching these women who were so vulnerable and shy and knew nothing about business, and in just two years boldly telling uh, Fuji Oil that no, we will not sell to you at this rate and at that rate. And for me, that's one of the, the, the indicators of empowerment. It's a, an odd one, but being able to negotiate, women being able to negotiate and drive a hard bargain, even though they are in rural areas and that nobody can come and cheat them. I was so moved. So that's why they are smiling. They are just finished the bargaining <laughs> for their 500,000. And now they are doing the products as well. And now we are also looking at, um, We've applied to the skills fund and other donors We're also looking at maybe producing some cereals and other things so that is the power of uh, the cooperative model because you have a group of women they can create products you can train them and so we like to think that uh, we want to create production hubs which are mini factories um where you can have 20 to 50 women and they are doing something very simple it can be uh, products that are coming from um post harvest loss etc that you turn into jam canning tomatoes, et cetera, et cetera. But these are fast moving goods that they can sell in their local areas. You don't even need to get international market to be able to sell them. So next slide, please. And so these are uh, another group of uh, women in Nangu, uh, Nalerigu. And I chose the, the, the Northeastern regions because they excite me. Nobody knows what goes on in those regions. We split these new regions, uh, their district assemblies, et cetera. So when you look at the poverty ranking, indexes, etc. they are very, very vulnerable. So by virtue of even going there, you're already hitting your impact indicators. The same with Northern Senegal, like I said, it's a, it's a zone recovering from conflict. You have um, all kinds of disabled and uh, fiscally challenged people, albinos, this, um, migrants, et cetera, et cetera. So by even the, choosing that location alone, you're already 80% in terms of having impact, whatever you do. And then you're able to, you know, so this is the kind of impact impact investors love to see. And then they love to see the financial profit and the model, et cetera. And then when you are doing that, then donors get excited. Then they can come and say, okay, we can now come and give you this for SGBV. We can now come and give you for psychosocial support for these women. We can now give you overheads, et cetera, et cetera, because you actually have an impact. Next slide, please. And so this was... Um, uh, this was funded by Global, Global Affairs, and this was our food and beverage incubator. And uh, one of the challenges with our value chains is that uh, some of the incubators, a lot of the incubators actually teach you business models, et cetera, et cetera. But what Africa really needs is us to go to the roots of things and be able to look at specific value chains and what is the help that is needed there. So here I had a general, we did a general incubator. We had over 150 girls participate. They had products, they came and learned everything about good manufacturing practices, food, hygiene, et cetera, et cetera. We had trainers from FDA, it was a three month long uh, program for them. But afterwards there's ongoing support. We are about to launch another one next year and it's on cashew, soya and granite in the incubator will be those who are working on those specific products and how do we get them to a level where they now meet international standards you know in rural areas you have to be quite specific if you are working with the vulnerable what do they have and you create your model around that and you can go as low as that specific granite value chain and that is the expertise and everything and then you have machines you have everything to support them so they can continue producing at low cost etc so that's a whole different model that uh, we have been running with. I don't think we are the first, but this is what the future of Africa is looking. And when people come, they see your measurable physical impact. It's not long report writing. 
<laughs> because you realize that with impact investors, they, they don't like those long 50 page reports that uh, other donors like, you know. But like I said, none is bad, but the, them coming together actually is what will actually uh, uh, catapult this um, continent into the, into, in, into the new age. Because what does it do? It creates jobs. Uh, many of these women are also st students. So having taught them that, and then we support from the National Service Secretariat where you can go, if you have a product now, you can actually go and then you can be considered to do your, so, uh, your, your, your national service through for one year through your own organization. So you can be an entrepreneur and if you pass certain requirements, uh, they'll pay you because now there's, there's, there's no longer any job space, et cetera. You can be paid to actually focus on your product. And so that's what we are taking advantage of. And we are about to do the same thing with British Council in Kenya, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the kind of new models that we are talking about. This model may not work for you at all, but you can come up with something really beautiful and innovative, et cetera. And then all of these, now we had a little shop and now that's the market. So now they are selling, they are distributing, et cetera, et cetera. And we are looking forward to receiving five years funding to be able to continue that on a wider scale across all the five Northern regions. Next slide, please. So I just gave like the idea. I wanted to be as practical as possible. So I said, okay, let me just take a snippet of the application proposal. I asked my, my team <laughs> if I was allowed to, and they said, yes, I can take this bit and share with yourself so that uh, you get the idea. We pushed, so we are combating COVID-19 and sexual and gender-based violence, which is my and our social innovation, our core thing. Combating COVID and sexual and gender-based violence through advocacy and through entrepreneurship scale up. Because our brand of feminism is a social feminism where I believe that you can never get anywhere when you're working with women in SGBV, if you don't add the economic aspects, you know, the vulnerabilities of these women are heightened by the fact that uh, they have nothing and they have no jobs. It's the same with the young people, whether they are at risk of SGBV, et cetera. So that's my core thing. I have no other message for Africa. And this is very interesting because IGAD, as a, 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 a regional economic unit, actually has also bought into this. We have a program on women, peace, uh, peacekeeping, and, you know, and social enterprise. Because looking at conflict zones, looking at young people in the Tigray region, et cetera, I've spent time with them. And it all has to do with jobs and creation of opportunities, et cetera. So I don't believe, me personally, and I don't know if you disagree. Uh, beyond hey, point, man, beyond, man, uh, um, a model, Hello, Michael Tachi. Kindly put your mic on mute. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Anatu. No Please problem. continue. <laughs> so how do we now be able to implement the same things that we've been implementing? but with a business model to allow communities to not revert back. And, you know, so now I'm also looking at taking this model into North in Nigeria, et cetera, so creating a brand, a production hub, in addition to all the advocacy and lovely community cohesion and dialogues, blah, 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 whether they are weavers, whatever it is, how do we now bring them this reality so that uh, they stop being recruited, our young people stop being recruited, our women stop being abused, and even the men and the failure. There's so much going on, as you know, in Burkina Faso, everywhere. One conflict ends and 10 more rise up. And I believe that the core issue has to do with this issue of lack of opportunities. You know, I'm not saying it's the cause of everything, but it is really the cause, you know. And I sat down with several ambassadors, several regional economic units, et cetera, and ECOWAS and Igat said, yes, we'll do this. So when we talk about now working around areas of interparty, African interparty dialogue mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. It is because this also plays a factor there. You've got to be able to go into communities and not just talk, talk to them about political theory and what is good and what, if they are hungry or they have, don't have opportunities. So you marry all of them together. We're also looking at African philanthropy. It plays a role in this. How do we now nurture philanthropy? And I don't know, the problem, one challenge that people have is that they think that sometimes I have the answers. I don't. One thing that I, I try and tell people when I'm preaching is that a lot of things have not happened for Africa. So we have to create those models. They are not just sitting there. You know, we have to now imagine them. So you need a kind of philanthropy priest or investor who understands what you're trying to get to because it's not just lying there or those opportunities there. Other continents may have perfected it over the last century, et cetera. It's still new. So sometimes when I'm working with organizations and I'm like, do you have money for experimentation? because there's no fixed guarantee or model. You know, we have to find that solution and we have to find money to support that whole system of finding out what actually really works for us 
in the short and long term for Africa? And how do we own those things? And how you, so that is the, the, the journey that uh, we are on. And, uh, and that is what we have gotten to. So next slide, please. So now this is, so when I design uh, 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 an impact investing model, I, I like, I'm, I'm a bit slow. I don't know about you. I'm a bit slow and you know, so I, I'm, I'm not an academic. So I like pictures and images. And so uh, this model, I thought I'll share with you just to give you an idea. Look at this is Women's Entrepreneurship Livelihood Initiative. Now we have at the center COVID and SDBV advocacy. We all know that very well. Now you have the access to markets initiative. Okay, let's start on the other side. Access to gender justice, strengthening networks of women because we have to work through networks of women as well. Uh, dissemination of research and learnings, entrepreneurship scale up, access to finance and access to markets initiative. And I believe that this is one of the models that if Africa engages or employs towards SGBV, we actually do it well. But uh, I imagine this, so that's what I would say. <laughs> Somebody might disagree. So now we step down. And so we had uh, in Senegal, we decided to we chose aromatherapy as the product that was, you know, because Senegal, aromatherapy is very common. They have a lot of skin, you know, so I thought, oh, this is great. So with that, we have, um, the community radio trainings, all the normal SGB stuff. And then we also have psychosocial support. We have the VSLA, and then we have the, the cooperative in the middle, which is the one doing the aromatherapy product. So we had 2000 women in there. And that was so exciting. Um, really, really exciting. Sitting in villages and talking to women and being able to see change happening around all of this. But this only happened because Global Affairs Canada was willing to ex experiment with us and work with us towards this. They liked it. So you also need to start changing donor mindsets and writing and publishing and all those things if you want them to understand that uh, these things are not just lying that you can't just go into communities and do the old things. We need money to ideate, we need money to explore. Second one was the uh, Palm Oil Cooperative in Volta region, which has one of the highest numbers of, of uh, sexual and gender-based violence. You know, So we chose uh, Palm Oil to work with Palm Oil Cooperative so what we did, we standardized the product certification, teaching the women, training them in their own language, scaling up their production, their empowerment. You know, that place has a lot. I mean, I was missing a lot of cases of women who are suffering from incest. I don't know why. Uh, working with the district assembly even now in Afajatos uh, North South to determine why that place has such, uh, 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 what should I say, uh, that high amount of record, you know, I'm, I'm getting emotional. Uh, of uh, a sexual and gender-based violence, especially incest, you know, and things like that. And this happens in our communities, you know, as much as we like to cover it up, you know, even when our, our MNE advisor was going to collect data, et cetera, a man came there trying to kill uh, his wife because uh, she doesn't respect and you know, he was drunk and she said she was leaving him because he doesn't work. You know, you go and the women are so forlorn, teenage pregnancy from the age of 16, how, the highest rate. How do you not transform a community where there is no economic opportunity. So I met a lady and uh, she was telling us, one of our, the, our, 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 our beneficiaries, and you know, her, her, she had gone to live with her brother because of financial difficulties. And uh, he had impregnated her three times and caused her to cause forced abortion. And then the last one, the baby was not even dead when he went to bury it in the middle of the forest one night. Can you imagine? And this girl is just 12 years old. So I, we really have to begin to look at not just going beyond advocacy to actual real examples where we are touching lives in the highest order. And one of the things that uh, impact investing does is that it takes away all the fluff and the things that a lot of people hide behind and staff overheads, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, you'll be well paid. Yes, there's provision for everything, but you actually have to be implementing a project that is directly impacting a community. Now, the other one on the, on the left is uh, the food and beverage incubator. And we did that uh, in Northern Ghana. Um, working with MasterCard to also, uh, we are at the final stage uh, to also win, hopefully win a, a, another grant to be able to spread this across the country because it creates jobs, it gives opportunity to young people, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to go into that because time is going, but uh, I will leave this image uh, for you. So that can be done in several countries. And so this was in Ghana and Senegal. Next slide, please. And so this is me and some of my lovely women have been living in Northern Ghana as my base for the last two years. I live in a village. I live in a mud hut, but it has air conditioning. <laughs> and I love being there and hearing their stories 
And these are some of the women we are working with in the Presby Agri uh, Services. It's just outside of, uh, it's near the Savannah region. We had just finished doing a project on value addition in the shea butter chain. And they have a, that's their shea butter processing center, et cetera. And we are looking at the wonderful things that will also happen with them next year. So that's a really practical example of how impact investing works. And on that note, I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. I should Thank you so much. You in the Yum Taba, you know, in the northern, northern part of Ghana and, and my own hurt should not have an air condition. I want to feel the natural conditions of that lovely place. And that, that was so, so, you know, mind blowing and, and, and inspiring, emotional, touching at the same time. And, you know, I could, I could, you know, appreciate how you are seizing some of the menaces to our very being as humans as opportunities, you know, to help us or to give us humans the opportunities to, to evolve. Thank you so much. And I'm very happy to see those women smiling. Please extend the regards of Waxi and everyone here to them that hopefully someday, somehow, we will get to have one of them speak in such engagements like this. And why not okay. share their experiences with, with, with us? You know, you, you, you said something very, very critical. A lot of things have not happened for Africa. We have to create the models. Yes. And to do so, we need to change donor mindset. You know, mm -hmm. write, mm -hmm. publish, and yes. let the world know about what we are doing. Thank you so much for this groundbreaking, alarming calls that we need to take up. And I'm very sure participants here present are actually following. Many colleagues are actually sharing in the chat, you know, they just want the slide. They've not even seen the slides from Yuan yet. They are already asking for the slides. And <laughs> please, we will share all the slides and the recordings with you all. Just do well to um, um, click on the registration form that is being shared in the chat and put in your details, you know, so that we can, um, um, share these pieces of information with you. Um, I just have here, you know, one of your fans actually uh, shared a comment in the chat, you know, basically appreciating the work you're doing. I can't get that again. Okay, this is it. Rich and amazing insight, Anatu. You know, mm -hmm. I am a cheerleader of your social impact investing model. Kudos and keep up the great work. That's from Harrison Owusu. I'm sure you do know him. You yes, know, I one do. of your cheerleaders, <laughs> promoting, supporting you Thank in you, the Harris. great work that you are doing. And colleagues, for those who have questions, do share them in the chat. We will be taking uh, Yuan's perspectives after which we are going to have a conversation. But please, I really want to kindly plead with you all, don't turn on your mics yet. You know, I really appreciate 99.9% of us all are not switching on our mics, which is wonderful. Let's just follow that. And in a short while, we will be, you know, have, we'll have the opportunity, you know, to share our perspectives when that time comes. Yuan, we are moving from a very blended presentation from Anatu, talking about the genesis, the, the theoretical thinking behind social impact investment, and then into practical application on the African continent telling us that it's possible. However, in Africa, in West Africa, we are not working in silos. Many things are happening out there that we need to learn from. And we are so happy to have you all the way from Colombia with your rich and diverse experiences. Share with us so that we can learn even more and have more critical insights on how best to know how the social impact investment can work for us. Yuan, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, and, and, and thank you very much uh, to, to Anatu. It, it was very inspiring. I agree with Jim. Um, and I, I, I very much loved uh, your insights also into the pros and cons. Um, you know, uh, because I, I very much coincide with you uh, with in, in, into the fact that uh, it's no longer, um, you know, only seeing the bad things or the threats that this uh, can pose to us. We, as, as everything in life, there's there's pros and cons. And if we were aware of them, um, if we're better aware of them, we could take 
uh, into consideration the advantages as well and how we can capitalize as well the power uh, that in a way or the other, you know, markets provide for us to generate impact and for in, in the end making really a, a much better form of capitalism than what we have today one that actually fights inequality, that ends poverty, that helps us get all those jobs done. So mm -hmm. um, um, thank you so much uh, for this invitation to, to uh, Waxi and uh, the partners organizing this forum. And thank you all for being here and connecting. I come from Impactia, um, which is uh, uh, in the end, in the very basic form, we are a tech company, but we are a tech company that was created to do good, to use software, to use data, and, and more recently to use FinTech um, for good. Um, and a, a bit of what I'm gonna be talking to you about is, you know, how is the future starting to look like? And I, and I agree with, with Anatu that it's no longer the future, it's, ha it's, it's happening right now. It's been happening for a, quite a while already. And uh, we need to make sure, I mean, that it's not a future for civil society, but that we start making it a present. Because as you'll see in the last few slides, we need civil society highly involved um, in impact investing. Just a, a, a few words about what we are um, in, in Impactia. We, we're um, a platform um, where we've been working um, to connect three key actors, those who have the financial capital, those who have the project ideas and impact ideas, and three, those who have the, you know, those advisors and experts that have the know-how that can help us glue all that together. So what we do with, from, from our platform, uh, where we have more than uh, 50,000 users interacting every day, um, is we connect on one hand, uh, those three actors, funders and investors with entrepreneurs and organizations and with advisors and accelerators. We help have a more efficient, effective asset management process where we can cut down the costs of the money flowing around and make sure that more money arrives to the actual projects to the ground. And three, we're facilitating the follow-up the supervision, the monitoring, and the reporting on the impact that all those funds are generating. A lot, um, something else we, we do very much um, as part of our duties is we, since we have so much data, we, we very often um, engage into uh, projects of research where we can use the data that we're collecting, the know-how that we have from our product te development team as well, and we share it with others and we help having those, you know, we use those reports to help our, our product be a better product, more adjusted to reality and, uh, and, and also to understand what's going on out there. So this is, the, you have the QR code there to the link of one of those reports, the one of them that is in English, but we've been using a lot of the data to understand what's going on with the financial flows, um, you know, what's going on in terms of the real access to funding and financing by civil society actors, what's going on, and this is more recent, from the impact investor side, you know, what are their pains, what are their uh, problems, because the product development perspective and design thinking, what in the end it gives us is the opportunity to look at solutions, but from understanding the pains and perspectives of all the actors. So in this particular case, a lot of what we've been doing in the last four years is understanding which are the problems of the ecosystem, you know, of uh, entrepreneurs and civil society organizations out there, you know, and using the pains of the donors and the uh, impact investors to solve the ecosystem um, problems as well by solving their problems. So uh, a lot of what we want to make sure is that we engage into a better way of doing things all together. So it doesn't have to be, hopefully, 
as traumatic, as difficult, as challenging as it is today to have the right resources to have the increased impact that is demanded from us nowadays to reach the 2030 agenda. We are seven years away almost from the end of the 2030 agenda. We need to speed up. We need more capital. We need higher and more scalable impact. And this is a lot um, of what is related to what I'm going to be describing. So I'm going to pass very quickly. So to us, a, a couple of the slides where, um, you know, uh, Anatu has done an excellent job of explaining. Uh, so we can get into, you know, not only showing you some additional information, but also hopefully to having a conversation later on. This slide only talks about how we used, you know, how we used to do fundraising, you know, which were the sources of funding generally for civil society organizations. And you're very familiar with all of these. Um, the truth is that there's new mechanisms um, of making sure that the financial resources arrive um, to civil society, not only of funding, but also financing mechanisms that are very key to get to know. And we'll be talking about those four to the, in, in, a, in a minute. Where did these came about? From identifying difference to the Millennium Development Goals, when the SDGs came out, there were task forces that were saying, well, okay, let's make sure that there's enough money, enough financial resources to fund this very ambitious agenda to 2030. And when they did that, they, they found out that the estimated cost of delivering the agenda was went from five to seven trillion dollars per year. Um, and the truth was that when that number came about, they understood that there were at least 2.5 trillion per year missing. So when they got to that situation, they said, okay, well, let's look at our pockets and see where we can get some extra money from. And the usual sources were either in financial crisis or out of budget. So that's when the international community started looking for um, the private sector, larger private sector involvement not no longer from the perspective of uh, social corp corporate social responsibility and donations, but involving them by using um, market mechanisms to make sure that enough sufficient um, resources arrive. And that's what in various publications they've been calling, you know, this call to action for moving from funding to financing. So there's, at least four, uh, there's, there's very many of these, but, but I'm going to talk about at least four examples of how impact investing is being applied, you know, four examples of mechanisms. Um, one is blended finance. The second one are the bonds, the social and green bonds. The third one are social impact bonds, that it's very strange because in a financial term, it, they're not real bonds. They just have that in the name. Um, but I'll, I'll get to that later. And then uh, a lot of what um, Anatu has been uh, explaining uh, earlier, you know, the impact investment in social businesses model. But before getting to all of them, um, a key thing is to show you this map, because in the end, this map um, explains, you know, the whole panorama, the whole spectrum of how financial investments uh, look like today. So on one side of the spectrum, you have profit only um, types of investments. On the other complete different side of the spectrum, you'll have impact only. And from there, um, the marvelous thing is what's going on in the middle. You know, those two sides were the only things that existed 10, or maybe 15, 20 years ago. But nowadays that has shifted radically and I think Every year in the past five years has been a roller coaster in this sense. You know, new innovative ways of doing things, new mechanisms, some becoming even mainstream uh, types of investments. Um, so this really has become a very dynamic way to engage the private sector into generating impact. Um, I'm going to explain from one to the other, but if, if you start on the profit only, you know, the in initial types of investments, 
that for centuries have been going on, you know, those traditional investments are the profit only. Uh, what an example of that is, you know, when you when a company has invested in uh, infrastructure, um, in a you know a, a shopping mall where mainly what they want to do is uh, money out of this uh, by a business model that delivers and helps certain businesses sell out their products, right? Um, the intentionality behind it is to make profit. That has been going on for centuries. If you start on the other side, you have grants and donations. That's the type of um, investments that are typical to the impact only. So grants from governments, grants from, from philanthropy, um, um, many, many of them old school where they would just give you the grants and not even require a, um, a project or anything in, 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 the, uh, um, in exchange for that. Um, just the idea of supporting, you know, organizations and people who are doing good. And then the donations that come from the public and sometimes from private entities as well, um, but that um, do not expect, expect anything in return, sometimes not even a reporter as well. Just, you know, there's a lot of trust in the fact that I'm giving this funding to you because of what you stand for, because of what you've done in the past, and because I believe in you and I want to be engaged in you, with you some way. Now, I'm going to start from there, moving to towards the um, um, no. I'm going to start from the profit only, moving to the right. So, if you start looking at the spectrum, you see that uh, right, just to the right, to the traditional investments, you have uh, other types of investments that are called the ESG investments. the The acronym comes from economic environment, sorry, environment, social, and governance uh, types of investments. Now. In this case, this type of investment, they're going to be wanting to invest. These are companies and in, in very large investments, some of them with tickets be, you know, way beyond the $20 million per investment or, 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 or hundreds of dollars or of millions of dollars uh, per investment. Now, these types of investments are investments that today are a lot more focused on the environmental side of this. So um, and energy transition, um, um, solar energy, wind uh, uh, energy, those, you know, massive infrastructure, um, some of them, so sometimes hydroelectrics. And, and when I start mentioning this, this is where this, you know, I also have to say these ESG investments, they, there's still a lot of gray in between. They're so, they're kind of new still. They're, they're, there's a lot of enthusiasm on the market um, for them because they are investments that generate an impact, but that don't sacrifice any type of market value. Um, they're market-based profit. They, they're going to want to expect returns on market rates, right? The big question around these ESG investments has to do with the definition. You know, do, are these investments that have the intentionality of doing good? Um, are these, you know, where what, what's the line that divides investments that are doing good from those that are just simply mitigating doing wrong? Um, so, so there's a lot of discussions around these ESGs, and and a, a very big, big one is how much do you need to demonstrate that these investments actually are having an impact, and what's the um, responsibility of those investors there. But the truth is that in the end, theoretically speaking, these are investments that are at market rate, at very large levels uh, of volumes, and that will generate positive impacts on the environment, on social um, um, metrics, and on governance. Then if you move a little bit to the right, further to the right, you'll see the impact investment. And um, uh, and Atwood did an amazing job, but just as a summary for those who came in um, afterwards of the of her explanation, there's an intentional, intentional and measurable impact. And um, intentionality is one of the three characteristics of impact investing. Measurement uh, of the impact is a second characteristic. And the third one is that there's profitability, but at times below market levels. You know, so there's a lot of flexibility and most of the cases of impact investment um, 
as Anatu was saying, they you need to demonstrate that there's profitability behind that project, that there's a, the opportunity to grow. But a lot of the impact investing funds will be a lot more flexible in terms of the profit uh, return on investment that they expect. So many times they'll be some points below market levels um, in exchange for a very strict and measurable impact. That's also there. There's still a lot of doubts whether or not that measurable impact is taking place in all cases. And there's a lot of challenges in making that happen. Now we're going to be moving to the right again, catalytic capital. You know, So there's intentionality in the impact, a very high intentionality in the impact. These are projects where there's high financial risk, where this catalytic capital, if there's profitability, they'll be interested in gaining, you know? But they do know that there's large chances because of the high financial risk involved that they will not get any profit, you know? So a lot of the, um, let's say, old school philanthropic institutions have started moving towards the catalytic capital um, spectrum or side of the spectrum where um, many times they, they've been able to involve or engage themselves into uh, investment vehicles that sometimes when they have financial risk, these resources will, let's say, be available for furthering their investments in other types of um, catalytic capital projects further on. So having said that, how much money are we talking about? Well, well this is what you should be also very interested. In. And I apologize because um, a lot of the data I have is regarding the Latin American uh, ecosystem. The truth is that uh, th these are the numbers of impact investing only, not, not ESG. I'll give you a bit of the numbers of ESG. But, but when we're talking about impact investing, it's all the whole market of impact investing today of assets under management by um, those who have invested, we're talking about a trillion dollars already. Of that trillion dollars, uh, apparently this year, Latin America has had has been able to grow to 1%. So here we were measuring, calculating 15 billion, including there also international cooperation. But the truth is that the amount, the speed of growth of the impact investing um, assets are much, much faster and larger than uh, international cooperation that for some years, to, to some extent, has been um, stopped at a certain level um, of, of funds. So in the case of Latin America, international cooperation is almost $10 billion. In the case of Africa, it's at least six times more than that. Um, um, the amount of investments uh, of impact investing in Africa are reaching, uh, I, I believe, 15% of the total world market. Now, these are numbers that are changing every day, that are growing very quickly, and that you need to take a look at. Um, now, when we're talking about ESG investments, those investments made a huge breakthrough in the last two, three years. We're talking about a global market of almost $70 trillion of ESG investments. And out of those, uh, and those $70 trillion potentially in the next uh, three, three years, uh, I think this year, the final number that uh, Bloomberg was uh, mentioning a few days ago is that this year it will close at $41 trillion and that we can expect in the next two, three years to close to pass that 70 trillion um, milestone that I was mentioning. Now, what is very essential about knowing here is that when we talk about $40 trillion, we're talking about one third of all the global investments. So why these things matter is because despite the limitations they still have, the room for improvement there is, and that I've mentioned, we're talking about financial resources that could really, really make social and environmental change happen. Because in a way or the other, what all of these capital sources well, show true. us is that in the end, 
we've learned in civil society very in a way good but in an other ways bad to work without resources so when we work without resources we really sometimes make a lot of effort to get the job done but don't end up moving that much the metrics the social impact environmental impact metrics as we would want it to you know so talking about the amount of money is very key here i'm going to get into each of the very briefly so that we can have some time to talk to the four different examples I've, I've, I've wanted to share with you. So blended finance, and I have to explain it briefly, it's a mixture of finance, so of financial sources. Um, how it works overall is you will always have uh, one, let's say donor that is willing to lose um, and to take larger risks in the case of, um, you know, whatever ends up coming out with the project. Many times these will be international development corporation um, institutions, public institutions in some very few cases, and philanthropy has taken a very, very large role there to take the larger risks. And by taking those larger risks, um, one of the intentions that those public entities have is to incentive, uh, to, to increase the incentives for private sector capital to leverage funds to those that the public institutions will have. So many times in blended finance uh, mechanisms, you will see that they will double, triple, or even more the amount of money that the public institutions are putting forth on top of the table. Um, partly uh, the intention here is to attract capital, but partly it is to also make sure to show the path and show the way and bring technical expertise to that capital. So in the end, there these you know this these uh, new mechanisms are also a way to exchange knowledge between actors that have a lot of information on how to get Im impact done, and other actors that have a lot of knowledge on how to make it sustainable financially and scalable in a way that that so those types of activities can be increased. So. As I was saying, the top, um, I don't know if you can see my, um, my. Mm, let me see, show you here. Okay, so these are the private sector actors, the ones I've, I, down below that I'm showing you. These up here are the public sector, or let's say the grant money givers that they're, or catalytic capital, that are willing to take larger risks. Um, in this type of mechanisms. So usually what they will have is either provide grants or um, they will provide technical assistance to lower the risks of these, or they will take a large coordination job here, um, but definitely a very low equity investment. So if things go well, um, they're willing sometimes to um, profit out of it, but a very large, smaller amount of profit in comparison to that uh, that is taken by the private sector actors, right? In this case, um, most of the social impact projects um, that, you know, the money will be in invested into a social impact project that has profitability, of course. And a lot of the cases have gone around farming projects, renewable energy, roads or infrastructure, clean infrastructure, hospitals, schools, um, these, you know, this blended finance mechanism has been very much used in, in all those cases. Um, one example of it, uh, let's see I, how I can, oh, sorry. There we go. So um, one example that I wanted to share with you is actually from uh, Africa. It's the African Agriculture and Trade Fund. You can look it up um, in, in the website I, I, I'm giving you here on the screen, uh, but also on Google. Um, and in this case, you had various actors. Um, let me show you all of them. So you had the Deutsche Bank on one hand. They had a um, $64 million investment on B shares. What, what does B shares uh, mean? These are shares that, let's say, get, get uh, um, a profitability, but um, not 
as high or let's say with, not with all the conditions, the great conditions that the private investors will get, then in this case, you would have the German cooperation um, with the junior first law C types of shares. They invested 66 million in this and they were willing to lose them all if that was the case. Um, they were the ones who would do the first loss um, in a way, taking the risk of the Deutsche Bank and the private investors. And then based on that, they, uh, the private investors would uh, inv ended up investing 42 million with uh, senior A shares. So these was one of the first blended finance um, experiments that took place. You will see nowadays, since there's a lot of more trust in these types of mechanisms, that uh, actually a, a lot of the percentages have invested. In this case, it was an investment by international corporation of 66 million, and then by private investors of 42 million. Um, nowadays, it, it would be the other way around usually. So, so a smaller amount of investments are from the international corporation and a larger amount of investments from the private sector. In this case, they had the role of the Deutsche Bank um, that is, you know, as you know, also a private sector actor, but very much linked to to the public sector back then, um, and and they were able to kind of like cushion the whole situation. So what they ended up doing through African um, Agriculture and Trade Fund is actually leveraging from sixty six million a total of one hundred seventy two million dollars to provide loans to sustainable agricultural projects um, and investments in Africa. Um, and then I'm just providing there a couple of examples of, of those who received the investments. Let's get now to the social or green bonds. These are bonds, you know, like traditional investment bonds. What is a bond? A situation where there's an issuer of the bond that is a debt in the end. They will issue the bonds that can be exchanged in markets. And an investor um, will be providing that capital, will be paying or buying, let's say, those bonds when the issuer that usually will be a central bank or a, or a, or a, or a private sector bank, um, they will be providing the financial capital or giving the financial capital to the issuer. And then years later, the issuer will, will secure a repayment plus interest to the investor. So it's a typical case of you know, the investor lends the money and then years later they repay with a difference. And it is that when the issuer gets the money, they will um, provide bonds that can be sold and bought in, in various markets. Um, so so this is just a summary of, the, of what I've just mentioned. You have a, a governmental body or a private sector bank that will issue the bond. It could be traded in the market. The investment, the investors provide the money um, at a very competitive return rate, at an interest rate. And in, in these types of bonds, the social and green bonds that we've seen, the condition is that the money is later on injected or lent to either social impact or green types of projects. You know, in all cases, they have a profitability opportunity. And, and, and the most common cases in these types of mechanisms has been renewable energy, small and medium new enterprises. Um, many times in the case of Colombia, they've issued related to the um, Colombian peace uh, agreement to support new companies built by either victims of the conflict or um, ex-combatants of the conflict that have um, signed the peace, the peace deal. Um, a lot of, 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 the, of, of the social impact pro uh, bonds also have gone into converting agricultural products either from uh, commodities into more advanced types of products. Um, and here also we've seen cases uh, used for cultural um, types of or you know enterprises and, and education has been the case. This is another example that I've, I've bringing up, I've brought up. The IFC in this case was the issuer. Um, then you know the pay the the debt, uh, the money is provided by private sector actors to the IFC. The IFC later on gives the money to the different uh, types of businesses, um, and then years later the IFC will return to the private investors the. Um, um, the money with an interest rate um, on top of that. And this, of course, after um, just rounding up 
the experiment where many of those businesses, most of those businesses will be paying the debt back at comfortable rates. Um, some potentially will fail. And in a way or the other, the issuer is kind of also um, taking off the risk of um, from the private investors. Um, I'm, 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 I'm here giving you a couple of those examples. One is from Colombia. The other one is from Romania. Um, and finally, uh, I, I know a third, a third case here, the impact investment into social business. I'm going to kind of skip a little bit briefly simply because we already saw that earlier in the presentation. But the, the key to this is you have businesses that both generate impact and are profitable and scalable. And then you'll have funds that are interested in investing money into those uh, businesses with the idea of getting an exit later on. What does an exit mean? That they can either... Um, share their, uh, uh, sorry, sell their shares that they bought in that company or that investment in specifically, or that the company gains larger value and um, that at a certain point, it becomes so big that it can go into the stock exchange and sign what they call in the private sector or the financial sector, let's say an IPO, you know, and that is when the company goes into a stock exchange market and starts um, offering their stocks on this stock exchange. Um, so these are the ways that the investors get the money back in a way. Having said that, um, very recently we run an analysis on how the you know most of the impact investing funds, at least in Latin America, were operating, and we identified that there's a large and growing amount of them that are working under very soft debt mechanisms. So it's not really impact investing in the, in the sense that they're going to invest into social businesses to get equity or shares of that business in the future, but that they're going to make sure um, to kind of lower the risk to them directly. They're going to make sure to provide a very affordable, a very comfortable debt they're going to demand impact investment um, metrics from them, uh, from the businesses, but they're going to also expect a payment back with interest later on. The interest that many times are more comfortable to what the private banks will be offering. Um, but all in all, these this is an example. Acumen Fund is one of the first impact investing funds. Um, this is what they, they've done um, until a couple of years ago investments in more than 100 social enterprises around the world. They invested more than $100 million and they have um, a participation in the profit or the exits of those businesses later on. Now, the, the interesting thing about the impact investing model of Acumen is that they um, receive the money from philanthropists, many times with a return on them and many times also as a donation. And finally, this is a little bit more complicated. So I, I'm, I'm, I left this uh, for last on purpose. The social impact bonds, they've grown a lot. And we, we a couple of days back, we had a very interesting, the first international uh, summit on, um, on uh, um, payment uh, on results models. And, and, and in the end, um, they, talk, they spoke a lot about the social impact bonds because they are a model where there's payments linked to impact results. Um, and I'm gonna explain to you a little bit more here in this um, slide. So how it works in the end is you have various actors. You have on one hand, and let me just draw this here. You have um, on one hand, um, can, you, can you see my, my, no, I think Your you can see it. Let me, yeah, can, I can, can you see, see it? yes, to the okay. left, defined development okay. problem to solve. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So how the social impact bonds work, you will usually have a government entity defining a development problem that needs to be solved. So from the examples of social impact bonds around the world, you'll have um, A, the challenge to uh, uh, lower down the reincidence on crimes uh, by people who formerly were in prison. Um, you will have other cases uh, on 
increasing uh, employee employability rates of a certain population. Um, you will have uh, other cases of lowering um, um, analphabetism. So the capacity to, you know, for have 100% of coverage of people reading and writing. Um, so mainly what the government will do is they will say, listen, we have this problem. This is the exact amount of uh, solution we want to the problem. So maybe the development challenge will be, I want somebody to lower the, um, uh, sorry, to increase the employability rate by three points in the next two years, you know? And they're gonna open a bit and then the private sector actors um, we're gonna will be starting to um, organize themselves to pre present a proposal on how to solve that problem, right? Now, a key thing here is that the government entity, besides um, defining the challenge, what they will do is they will say, "We, I will define the challenge, but alongside to this, if somebody, no, if that person who I choose, you know, that entity or that coalition who I choose will be able to solve that problem, then I will pay that coalition X amount of money. So what, what is really going on here is that the government entity is taking their hands off, uh, um, eliminating all sorts of risks to public budgets. So they will only be spent if the problem is solved. And they will not be spent if it is not solved uh, in the way that they define it. So how can we make this happen? So in the end, you'll have private sec you know, private capital that will take the risk of investing the money. Many of these um, you know, private capital comes from individual or corporate investors. And then you will have usually an NGO or another company, sometimes our social enterprise, that will want to implement these um, impactful activities to make the result happen. Another final actor that we'll have here is the validator. So, and, and usually these are consulting firms that will be overseeing the results that are being delivered by the coalition of investors and NGOs. And once um, you know the project is all over or the result is reached, they will inform the government Yes, this has been delivered. Yes, to the extent that you wanted it. And yes, within the conditions that you established. And once that happens, then the government will be paying back with an additional interest, not only the amount of money that they spent actually doing the job, but with additional interest rate on top of that in exchange of having taken the risk to solve the problem. So an example, and, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, in this case, we're also mentioning Colombia. And one of the reasons is because Colombia has become uh, some sort of oasis for the social impact bonds. There's all, already four that have been, um, it was the first one in the uh, global South to be issued. And right now there's four that have already been issued in total. Um, so in this case, you would have the national planning institutes that wanted youth employ unemployment to be lowered. They set up the conditions on how they wanted that to happen and how much um, they were willing to pay for that. And, uh, and there was an actually a consulting firm called Instiglio who structured the whole financial mechanism. Then you would have Fundacion Corona and Fundacion Cor Corona is a, in a philanthropic foundation. They were the ones that were willing to take the, mo the most of the risk and they received investment from two other um, philanthropic foundations, from the International Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, and from uh, the Swiss Corporation. So with the money, the investments they received, they were able to hire not only this NGO, Corporación Juntos Construyendo Futuro, but a series of other two NGOs that were very, very experienced on how to work on training and education programs and uh, helping out people from vulnerable areas of the country to be inserted into the labor market. Once they reached the goal in this particular case, they had a consulting firm, I believe it was Deloitte, who validated the uh, achieving of the 
of the bond. And once the bond was achieved, the National Planning Institute paid back um, the investment plus additional funds to this uh, coalition of organizations, specifically to Fundacion Corona, who took over all the risk. With that money, Fundacion Corona um, got engaged into other two or three. Now, the activity, and, and, and you know, it hasn't been highly profitable for Fundacion Corona. They haven't lost any money. That's one great thing. And they were a foundation created for generating impact. So they didn't lose money. They didn't have enormous profitability, but they were able to deliver their mission by taking a new approach on how to um, take on risk, but by also making sure that with a very results-based based approach, they could give other new forms of involvement to NGOs that were really good at doing these types of things. Now, just to close up, what is the, let's say, lesson out of this? You know, if you look at the SDGs across the board, you will see that there's some that are much more, you know, appropriate for certain amount of SDGs than others. We did this graph like two, three years ago. The truth is that in these two, three years, a lot of more new types of mechanisms um, have grown investing money into other SDGs than the ones that are here. So we've, re we've seen a lot of involvement, a lot of creativity in uh, both the social businesses the, um, and the types of, inv of uh, investment vehicles that have been created here. Um, and, and the key lesson here is that we have in front of us the opportunity through the private sector investments to kind of also make sure that some areas that are not too much fit, let's say, for or not as much fit for profitability to be covered by more grants and public funding, if we're able to divert a lot of more funding to go into those areas that are very attractive for the private sustainable investments. Now, not everything is wonderful at the moment. There's a lot of challenges, you know, and one of the key challenges is despite the fact that the amount of money is growing incredibly, it's still very, very difficult to find opportunities to invest in for investors and to manage those opportunities. So you'll be crazy to, to know, it's crazy to know, you'll be surprised to know that according to our calculations, close to 20% of the cash that investors have to invest in these projects remains in their bank accounts by the end of the year, mainly because they don't find the right projects that they want where they want they're comfortable to invest in. So what we're seeing is, is that there seems to be more money ready to be invested into impactful initiatives than impactful initiatives that are ready to receive those funds and those investments. There's a also an, a B another very high risk of reputational risks um, because of what we know more uh, about today of as uh, greenwashing. You know, so the poor impact management can very much lead to high reputational risk to the investors, and that's where I think civil society has a great opportunity because that's a lot of what we know how to do, how to manage impact uh, in the proper in the proper way. And a third challenge that we have here as an ecosystem, very, very high connection and management costs. So the, the transaction costs, the, the amount of money that we, we spend managing impact money is sometimes could get as high as to 50% of the money. You will have a lot of bureaucracy. You will have a lot of um, uh, procedures as we were mentioning, we were hearing before in um, in, in, in a loose uh, presentation. Um, and that leads to this sector being very uncompetitive to receive a lot of those investments. And that's a big challenge. We need to make an effort to be a lot of more competitive in terms of the, man the, the management of the funding that we receive and the, you know, the reporting cost around it to make sure that it lowers so that we can really be better at attracting this capital. What are the challenges when it comes to civil society, I feel, in terms of these new mechanisms? A, we need better dialogue. You know, this cannot be a thing only about investors 
becoming hippies. You know, we need to make sure that civil society is much better engaged into what's going on, that has more oversight over it, not only as a recipient of these financial flows, but also uh, in a way uh, as a verifier that these things are really delivering impact and that they really are making people more prosperous and not only that they're making investors more profitable and better feeling with themselves, you know? Um, we need also a better private sector. We need a, a private sector that is not only doing this because of the profitability, but because there's a lot of more conviction that the world that we have today is not the world that we can have in 20 years. And we need to make sure that the ethics behind it are brought up. And who more than civil society actors are better equipped to bring out those ethical questions, to be there connected with what's going on, but not in the denial phase that today we overall see. We have, um, you know, we're in the denial phase that this impact investing movement is the devil and we're not even going to talk to them. Well, you know, if we continue doing that overall, and there's of course a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, exceptions to that rule, but overall what we're seeing is we're, we're, we're afraid of what's going on. We're afraid of the financial sector. We're afraid of what can that deliver. And by being afraid and being far away from it, we're missing out on the chances to really delivering impact in a large scale. And we're missing out the chances of having a say on what's a better way of doing an impact investing, on what are better standards to implement. You know, three, we need to make sure that we don't, you know, we need to make sure that we apply, leave no one behind. We are very, very fearful in Impactia of, you know, the large gap of access to financial capital that we were seeing 10 years ago with only grants, grant money out there for smaller amounts of, for smaller NGOs, for grassroots organizations, now to be even tripled or escalated to levels that can, you know, be very scandalous. Why? Because we don't have the financial capacities in civil society. We need people with financial expertise there that can help us be better engaged. And finally, we need to be better also at monitoring and measuring the impact that we generate. Because in one way or another, for decades, we've been saying, you know, we're not valued because of the impact we generate. It's not fair, the money that is here and the amount of impact I'm generating. Well, guess what? We have now in front of us a new um, scenario where we can really measure how much doing impact costs. And that means that we can get paid back in a much better way by the markets because of the work and the expertise that organizations like you guys are delivering and have accumulated throughout the years. So just to close by, these are my contact details. My call to action is, it's no longer whether or not we're going to be involved. The big question is how, when will we be involved into all these things and make sure that we're engaged and vigilate, vigilating also what's going on there. And just a final thing, if you're interested to know more about these sources of funding, we haven't launched it officially yet, but we have uh, created a pilot exercise in the website mina.impactia.com. And of course, we have focused a lot more on the MENA part of Africa, but the truth is that a lot of the information you'll find there on impact investing sources and opportunities is in English, is in French, is in Arabic, and it's global. So you will be able to use it to kind of understand I checked it up earlier today and we had information of more than $6 billion of grants and investments for um, um, various of these types of initiatives. So make sure that you sign up um, for free and uh, that you use that information to do good and to scale that good that you've been doing for so long already. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yuan. That was quite, quite insightful. And again, uh, participants keep asking for the presentations. We just want to say we want to 
we are willing, we will be sharing. Please leave that slide on, on screen, Yuan. I'm sure some of us will be taking, taking note of those details, which is quite important, especially that, that website. You know, so um, for those who, we, not for those, for everyone here present, please kindly use the form that will be shared in the chat to enter your details so that we will share the recording as well as the, um, the slides with you. And also the recording is going to move, go on to Waxi's YouTube page in the days ahead. You can visit it in the near future from there. So if you have any questions, please do share with us. Meanwhile, Yuan, as you are presenting, Atunga Atuti says, this is very informative and timely at a time when CSOs and others are exploring alternative and relevant financing mechanisms for impactful and holistic development. Thank you very much, Atunga, for sharing uh, that feedback with us. So we will take some questions. Anatu, I hope you are there because um, there are really some very interesting questions that are popping up. Already we have some in the chat. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I can see Bubaka's hand is up. If you have a question, just raise your hand. We have a few a few minutes to go, uh, but maybe since I'm the moderator, I can share my question first. You know, I'm the first learner, of course. No, I will be the last rather. So let's take from a Bunlomo worker in the chat. This is, I think, a very critical question. How does a CSO that had been solely running on grants transit to social enterprise strategy? Uh, maybe Anatu and Yuan, we just take note of these questions and maybe we can take three or four and then um, we, 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 we leave you to respond to them. So there is the question on transiting from, you know, solely depending on grants to now moving to a social enterprise, uh, particularly capitalizing on this social impact investment model that we are talking about. Um, I will take Bubaka. We have, um, I can see two hands raised. Please, when you take the floor to share your question, kindly make it snappy. Go straight to the question, please. Uh, Bubaka, I will go with you. One minute, please, Bubaka. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir. You have the, please go on. Share your question, please. Yes, yes. Uh, I am a young guy who just ventured into agribusiness. So now um, wanting to know what are the step-by-step -step way forward to um, a grabs, uh, funding this kind of grants and funding. Will you, will you have a coach or a trainee? Because uh, in the Gambia, rural Gambia, we went for Gambia National Food Security Survey. I see there are women in hunger and so many things, young ones. So I think, why, what am I going to do in this, with this agribusiness? So as to impact this, um, life of young women and ladies and youth in the province, provincial Gambia. Okay. So I need that guy, the coaching and training and all that, not so that um, I, I, I am up there and, and impactful to the, my community. All right. Thank you very much, Bubaka. Um, Excellency, please. Excellency. Bubaka, please switch off your microphone. Um, okay, Excellency is not ready. Florent Lamar. Okay, yes, uh, Florent. Merci beaucoup de m'avoir passé la parole. Merci vraiment pour les étudiants aussi partagés, surtout avec uh, la première. J'espère que nos collègues ont partagé au Ghana, Sénégal par rapport à l'accompagnement des mouvements féminins. Et également aussi, ce que... Uh, Jean, c'est Jean, vient de présenter par rapport, à la, à, par rapport à, au financement. Et bon, je reviens un peu par rapport à notre système de travail, parce que nous, déjà, c'est la part de l'ONG Twin. Twin, nous avons fait aussi euh, des appuis au niveau des femmes, surtout dans les activités d'agir. C'est-à-dire, quand j'avais vu aussi leur présentation, la présentation de, nos, de la dame là, par rapport à la saponification, la fabrication des des de, de, de femmes en coopérative. Bon, nous, nous sommes vraiment beaucoup plus dedans, mais il y a de ces femmes aussi qui demandent souvent euh, des fonds d'accompagnement et peut-être aussi... Maintenant, j'ai un peu de soucis. Comment est-ce que, euh, par rapport à la présentation tout à l'heure, que euh, 
euh, notre euh, vient de, de faire. Comment est-ce que nous pouvons avoir accès vraiment à ces fonds-là Parce que nous, déjà, c'est la première expérience. Parce que nous, déjà, ce que nous vivons souvent, c'est à part des donateurs qui donnent et puis on les donne et puis c'est gratuit. C'est-à-dire qu'il n'y a pas de, il y a pas d'intérêt, il y a pas de, 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 de taux d'intérêt à payer, à rembourser aux femmes là, surtout les femmes vulnérables qui sont vraiment dans notre cadre de soins d'assistance. Merci beaucoup, um, Flora. Emily Wallet, please. Hello. Hello. Yes, please. You have the floor. Yes, please. Okay. Uh... It's my, it's my assistant that we're talking, and I just want to add to what he was saying. Is uh, we have these women, uh, vulnerable women that we are working with, that we are training to do like uh, 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 dying and party and materials to be sent on a warm market. We, we will be happy to get uh, in contact with somebody that we can share with how our our product can get out of uh, at the world market or at the popular place for people to buy okay hello thank you yeah. very much emily i think uh, uh madame anato can can very well in which country are you we are in guinea guinea, guinea is it guinea conakry guinea. oh that's beautiful guinea good so I think, uh, Madam Anato, um, you will have her contact, and uh, I hope you've registered on the form uh, so that we can share the presentations with you, as well as their yeah. contact, and you can get in touch with her for that. So please, um, there is also Thank one question you. in the chat. We take this, and then we get responses. John Oheneba says, um, how do you explain social impact investment ecosystem? I think that's a very broad question. So. I don't know, maybe we come, we begin with you, Anatu. Uh, maybe, I don't know, you can pick and choose which questions to respond to, and then uh, Yuan will come on board to complement your responses. Um, I would wish to give three minutes max to you, Anatu, then three minutes to Yuan. Anatu? Hello, Anatu, are you there, please? Yuan? I'm here. I, I can yes. I can start if you want. So yes, please you um, can start. Also, please uh, let me know if I didn't understand properly any of the questions. So uh, or one of the questions. So in terms of the transition, I think Anatu will, will be able to provide more insight as well because of the experience she's had. But I think um, one. I, I think there's a great opportunity in incentivizing what is called intra entrepreneurship within NGOs. Why? Because um, and I think this is the step number one in that transition. Every organization, no matter if they're an NGO or a private sector company, develops with time a know-how. And that know-how is very special and very unique in many ways. The key thing is understanding which is your know-how and how that know-how can be valued by certain markets. And sometimes, just to give you examples, it's things that incentivize your mission, but that in the end are not that linked with your activities. So you have, for example, cases of, um, of the Red Cross. The Red Cross in, in, in various countries has a lottery. And with that lottery, they, it's, you know, it's a different business. Um, they have also vaccination services that they do charge. They have also the rental of their infrastructure. They have also, in some cases, the um, examples training of uh, people that are, you know, working in in high altitudes or um, dog training. A lot of these business models that they created, they created them because they had something, they had know-how inside the organization that allowed them to create and pr to provide an effective service around that. So the third thing there to incentivize is once you know your, you know, that know-how and you take advantage of it, you're going to want to build a business model out of it. And you're going to want to make sure that you test the business model before you actually 
build a company out of them. The usual model of a social uh, enterprise that comes out of uh, a transition of an NGO is not that the NGO stops existing or that they change and stop doing you know, advocacy and other key things for society. Usually what happens is that a company will be built and the owner of the company is the NGO or the civil society actor, you know? And that will allow that company to have a lot of freedom in terms of the governance and what they can deliver to make sure that their business model gets to market and is profitable. But even more so in some cases, it will allow the um, that social enterprise to receive investment, to get debt in, if they want and they need it at a certain point in time to grow um, and to have the freedom of doing so without affecting the NGO and how it works, you know? So the, these are just very brief ideas, but I think the key concept here is intra-entrepreneurship. How do we promote entrepreneurial activity within an existing organization? A second answer and, and um, a second answer to what we have here to the questions, you know, how to avoid large interest rates. I think usually a lot of the impact investing actors that provide uh, financing through debt have that partic particular characteristic. And, and it is they either lend you under, uh, you know, under bank rates, so at a better, uh, at a better um, condition, or they will give you a freedom um, of actually not paying back until 24 or 12 months after you received the, um, the funding. Now, what you need to make sure is that you really are able to cover and to pay back for that investment. You know, um, some people had have worked with civil society and communities a lot using uh, interest rates in a very responsible manner uh, to what I understand is Kiva. And they lent money at close to 0% of interest rates to grassroots communities around the world. Um, but uh, in the end, they um, will have a very flexible way of sorting out the situations on when there's not a proper payback. Um, how is the impact investing ecosystem? I, I think it's a very difficult question. And I, as, as Jim was mentioning, a very broad question, because in the end, I, I believe that, you know, the impact ecosystem in the end is growing. When we talk about the impact investment ecosystem, we're talking about the professionals that know about impact investing. We're talking about the impact investing funds. We're talking about angel investors that are investing into impactful companies. We're talking about the philanthropic sector as well that is moving towards from grants only into more catalytic capital. You know, yesterday, for example, I met a foundation from the United States that uh, they get donations from various sources. And um, a lot of what they do, uh, let me just put out the name um, so you can look them up. Um, a lot of what they do is uh, Prime Coalition is their name. And what they do is they receive donations and um, they manage do donor advised funds for um, um, for various uh, individuals. And uh, with the money that they receive, they actually um, start experimenting in new financial models to invest into impact. They take larger roles. Sometimes they lose the money, um, but these are money that in the end was a donation that could have you know, been spent and that was it, but that many times and most of the times will have some sort of return in a longer run, but it will have a return that can be later on used to do more and more investments and continue growing the amount of money that is circulating in the impact. I think that the social enterprise is another key actor in the um, impact ecosystem and hopefully, hopefully governments and civil society organizations will be increasingly part of the impact investing ecosystem to do reports, to do the uncomfortable questions sometimes, but also to promote a better way of doing impact investing in a way that it reaches everybody and in a way that it leaves no one behind.
Thank you very much, Juan, for those very succinct responses. Um, we'll just take one more question before we close, but just to acknowledge the presence of Reha, uh, who is uh, actually, he has actually summarized this wonderful session in one picture. So he has shared the picture in the chat. For those who are interested, you can download it and keep it as your archive or in your archive, you know, but we will share an updated version if there is any after this session. Your Excellency uh, Fatumata, it will be good to hear from you. I will read your question and then I'll just call on you to clarify on um, one word. Yes, I can see my colleagues want to put the, the picture shared by Reha, Jehad Kruagen with us. Um, so your Excellency is asking, she says, excellent presentation, thanks so much. My question is, how can SIPs provide a capacity building or provide capacity building opportunities to women and youth to participate in decision making to influence policy for accessing markets, including uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement? And uh, just to say, you want the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is a, me a pan African mechanism that seeks to promote uh, free trade across the African continent. Uh, Madam Fatumata, it will be helpful to explain what SIPs mean. Um, and Anatu would have been best placed to respond to this. However, she's not there. So I'm sure uh, Yuan can share some insights based on his uh, experience from South America. Uh, Honorable Fatumata, are you there, please? Can you hear me, John? I can see you indicating. Can you hear me? Yuan, can you hear me? I can hear you. You can hear me. So, John, maybe I don't know why you can't hear me. Maybe you can check your device. Um, but, Yuan, um, do you have any insights that you can share with us on ways that we can capitalize on social impact investment opportunities to promote capacity building for women and youth? particularly in influencing uh, uh, policy processes that can facilitate access to markets. Yuan? I think one key thing, and, it, and it's definitely, not, I, I think the world uh, or the role of civil society as a contributor um, in pushing uh, for better policies in various areas is something will never fade away and should never fade away. Because it's it, what we're talking about with that role is the quality of democracy in itself, you know, um, which is something that we need to secure forever. But having said that, um, I think that the the involvement of you know what I've seen in the ecosystem, um, the involvement of several several. civil society actors in these uh, investment opportunities or Hello, this new scenario. I think we lost. Are you still there? Yeah. yeah. These capacity yes. because of increased. Yes, I'm, I'm here. I, are we? Are we? Yeah. Okay. Has provided increased access to financial resources and the increased financial resources in the right hands have generated increased impact. And that has been a game changer in terms of of the conversations that several civil society organizations can have with public policy writers. Because in the end, it changes a little bit the leverage that they have. It provides them with a lot of more legitimacy to provide ideas. Um, and why not say it? It, 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 to a certain extent, it increases the dependency that certain governments might have on the role of civil society because of what they're delivering, because of the financial capacities they have, because they become more influential in um, the national and local uh, uh, scenarios of public policy. So I think in the end, what we're talking about here is the possibility to lead by example, A, to be able to show out and do stuff that the government many times, because of role of how the rules work will never be able to do because they cannot take certain risks because they cannot do certain things with the public funding but civil society might lead the way and show you know these are mechanisms that could be implemented and you guys could do it or we could do it for you 
Wow, thank you very much for those very empowering and motivating words, Yuan. Um, I can't see any further questions. Once again, Gerard, thank you very much for that Tim, brilliant capture you. of this discussion. Can everyone hear me, please? We can. Great, great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, much. Gerard, for that. So, Yuan, I just, uh, so, you. yes, Yuan, I just want you to conclude, you know, it's, it's been an intriguing session. You know, you talked about the opportunities that it presents. Hanatu brought some very practical cases from across West Africa that shows that it's possible. And you've really hinted on the potential already with what you're creating in the MENA region. I think you made mention of a 6 billion fund uh, opportunity that that platform presents. And although it's for MENA, if we go there, if we visit it, we can start learning and seeing avenues where we can, you know, uh, tap these and, and most of those six billion, Jim, are for global, um, you know, Great. opportunities. So they're applicable to any country in Africa. Oh, that's that's very very helpful, and I think it responds to the question from Aaron. Um, I think he was asking. I want to find out whether there are some funding databases or places we can access funding opportunities. So, Aaron, uh, I think once we share the slides with you, you can take note of that uh, mena.impactia.com. I've already memorized it. You know, where there is money, we need to keep it in our heads. <laughs> you know, so you need to, you can visit it and make sure that you explore the opportunities there. Maybe one or two can benefit your institution. So, you want, what should be that key takeaway for us from this session? To me, is this is a topic we can no longer look away from. This is a topic we need to write strategies on how we will engage. This is a topic that we need to start increasing our organizational capacities in. We need to make sure that financial expertise is brought into our organizations, is taken away from banks and be put in practice for impact, you know? Um, and there's loads of people in the last two, three years that have said, I don't want to worry for money. I want to do good. We need to be able to give and open up the spaces for those people that know a lot about finance, but want to do good, to come into organizations, to lead change from here as well, to show us other things we have not seen. So the key takeaway, there's enormous opportunities out there. We cannot leave them there stand alone because we are afraid of the potential things that could go wrong. If we're always thinking about the things that could go wrong, we're missing out on the things that could go right with our hand put into it to secure that they go out right for everybody and that they deliver change, which is what gathers us all here. We, need, In the end, my call is we need more of these types of conversations. We need to create accelerators for inter-entrepreneurial social enterprises that are born out of NGOs. We need to make sure that we, we create our own funds to invest into high-risk opportunities. Um, that is, I think, um, you know, what what really the challenges up ahead lie uh, for organizations such as ours. Thank you so much, um, Yuan and Anatu. Also, thank you to the uh, interpretation team that has really made us to have a fluid conversation. Most of such sessions, you have our colleagues either from the English speaking side of the continent or the French speaking side saying we should interpret or facilitate communication in such sessions. The wonderful interpretation team has done justice to that. Thanks to Gerard, you know, for capturing these deep conversations, long conversations in a very succinct one slide, you know, that we can all engrave in our offices, on our laptops, and make use of them in due time. Gerard, it was a pleasure working with you, and we will continue, of course, working with you as the opportunity or opportunities present themselves. Um, at this juncture, I think it would be you. good to take a group picture. Uh, this is the last, once again, of a series of conversations on alternative funding models. Meanwhile, colleagues, can we turn on our videos? Um, I think this is just the last element, you know, so uh, even if the internet is that bad, it can't 
affect the session that badly. So um, just turn on your videos. I can see the wonderful, brilliant faces. Daniel Munzego, thank you for following. Esther Owusu, thank you for following. Charles Van Dyke, it was a pleasure being with you. Rosalind Okran, Etisain Medasi, Emily Wallace Lobo, it was good to have you with us. Njoku, I hope say Niger day well. Nancy can come, thank you very much for being with us. So Gideon, are you there? Are you ready to take the pictures, please? Yes, um, I know you um, have to take about three or four shots. So do yes. guide us at this juncture. Emmet, yes. I can see your video, please. Thank you very much. Um, please, all of us would have to turn on our video so we can see ourselves and take a very nice picture. Of course, with a smile. <laughs> so um, I'll count one to three, then the third one, we all smile and take a nice one. So one, two, three. Okay. Um, should should we say cheese? Yes. <laughs> so I think we should say cheese. cheese. <laughs> so one, two, three. With the cheese. 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 Nice. <laughs> Emily Thank said you. the best oh, cheese. Yeah. I could see that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh. Uh, are we taking another Merci. Gideon? No, we are, we are done. Thank you very much. All right. got... Merci. So thank you very much, oh. colleagues, for following. Uh, John, it was good to have you with us. Tachi Michael, you. all you oh, wonderful everybody. people. Emmanuel Marco, thank you. it's always good collaborating with thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Give you some nice music in the background to help us digest this wonderful knowledge. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Juan Gracias, Senor. Thank you. Thank you, guys. No, it's been, it was really marvelous. What, a, what an amazing crowd of organizations you had uh, rounded up here. Um, it, it really was brilliant. Thank and you. I, I don't know if, if, I don't know if you guys want it, but just just to to um to show you very very briefly the you know the, this is in the platform. No, leave the music. It's it's beautiful. Please. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the platform. It's all. I mean, you can you can um, request translation Spanish, French, and Arabic here. But um, once you open it and you register mm. and um, get a user in it, this is the amount of uh, opportunities that you have right now there. So it's six, a big 6.8 billion uh, US dollars. And um, you're gonna find each of these uh, opportunities up with all the information that you need from all sorts of opportunities. So, uh, you know, grants, uh, courses, scholarships, uh, 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 tenders, awards and impact investing. So if you're interested in the impact investing part, you will go to impact investing here and filter it out and you will see all of these opportunities here. So depending on the SDG that you are working in, you'll, you'll actually want to want to filter that as well, right? Um, so just, I don't know, uh, climate action. And, and then you're just going to go into e each of these and. As you can see, the amounts are, are enormous. Many, most of the times, um, some are not available because they not not because they don't have money, but because we they they they're not telling the public yet how much money they have to invest into all of these. And um, and once you you're there, you will want uh, let's say this um, you know green climate uh, private um, fund. You you're you're gonna go into the details of that opportunity and get more of you know the dates and what you know what are the deadlines that you will have uh there what is the general description of that mm. specific opportunity the characteristics and the link to it so you can go to it uh at once and make sure that you don't miss out and and the the platform is also helping you guys just you know save the things that you think are cool um so you can look them up later um, and then you will start seeing them here in the saved opportunities um, so you can keep track of what's going on. Um, it, it, as I said, it's a pilot um, platform. 
it's um, an experiment we did to understand if you know the Impactia model could help out and the information we use could help out other geographies as well. Um, and as, as long as we keep it as a pilot, we might as well be, you know, ho hopefully using it in other parts of the world as well. So um, just we'll keep in touch. Let me know how I can continue helping out. And, and please, um, um, you know, I can't be that those many years away from Africa uh, again. So, so let's, let's definitely keep in touch. I like that you are an African needs you. We need that collaboration to learn and share. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. It's really, really been very helpful. And uh, have a wonderful evening. Uh, and I'm sure for some of us, it's the close of year. We are looking at Christmas. Have a wonderful blast this end of year. Uh, Psycho Egg Jalo, thank you very much. And bye-bye. Uh, Enjoy the lovely music. Elias All right, Musanda. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Flora merci Lama, beaucoup. merci. Merci beaucoup. Et au revoir. Merci beaucoup à toi aussi, au revoir. Bye. Bye bye. Merci beaucoup, parlez-moi. Bye bye. Bye bye.